So, thank you for uh, the chance for this interview. Um, you are among others the co-founder of uh, Sage Case Management, a company that advocates on behalf of people who are uh, terminally ill or in need of complex medical care. Um, someone may characterize you as uh, a social activist. Can you elaborate a bit on your radiology? Uh, does it have anything to do with your choice to become an uh, independent scholar? There are three different questions there. Yes, yes there are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I had a quest to become an independent scholar. I ended up as an independent scholar because the independence of my thinking within my discipline does not work well within the traditional departments. So even when I had my first teaching assignment, when I was first hired to teach, I had several options and I chose the option in which I was going to be asked to teach in two departments and one interdisciplinary program. I chose that. But in the process of choosing that, which was a good choice for me in terms of my intellectual interests, which were always transdisciplinary, and which was a good choice for me also in terms of the kinds of people that I was able to teach with, it made me less employable in any standard university department. So because my record showed that I was never going to be a loyal member of any single department, it was very difficult to apply for jobs that had very traditional definitions of what an historian does. Moreover, my first teaching was not in academia at all. The first thing I ever taught was modern dance, contemporary modern dance which made me much more sensitive to the teaching environment in a classroom than people who are prepared to teach only through being in academic classrooms. So it meant not only were my intellectual interests cross-disciplinary and transdisciplinary, it meant that my teaching style was certainly not the same as the traditional historian in a traditional history department which meant also that reports about what I did in the classroom would seem strange to those who were hiring people who were going to be part of a research institution as well as judged on their merits as a teacher. My entire life as a teacher, all of the final exams I ever administered, the students themselves created the exam. <laughs> that is, they created their questions, which meant that they were invested in answering those questions, rather than me posing a question for them. But you can perhaps understand why this approach to teaching would make me unemployable. <laughs> so the last part of your question was the first, about yeah. altruism. In fact, it was my work in the history of medicine and the history of technology which made me a good medical case manager because I then knew how to approach and understand the medical terminology and the medical attitude toward the world that was going to affect each one of my clients. But I did not come to case management because I studied the history of science and technology and I taught the history of medicine. I came to that out of personal circumstances because I was there to work with my father before he died, to work with my mother before she died, and to work with a lover of mine who died of breast cancer. So my experience in those circumstances led me to think that I had certain qualities, both personal and intellectual, that were going to stand others in good stead in terms of helping them in complex medical conditions and situations. So, also judging from uh, uh, 
the book uh, on um, uh, what's the word uh, on death on uh, long on days the last thing. days yeah 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 so you get uh, you are personally involved with your um, subjects of uh, of study right judging from uh, ah I have a very interesting relationship to the subjects of my study. In most of the work that I have done on the history of millenarian movements, on the history of dieting, on the history of copies, the majority of people I have studied from past eras are people I would not have liked to be in the company of nor would they have preferred my company. However, working with clients who are in terrible medical straits, they have to agree, they have to agree that I can work with them. So we have no ability or desire to impose a certain projected kind of care on anyone. They have to agree that they need help. And then we come in and work closely with them, sometimes for hours a day, for months, for years even, to make sure that their lives are as whole and full as they can be while they are coping with very complex issues. That means that there's a difference often between the work I do with historical subjects and the work I do with people in my immediate environment. Um, also, you're doing uh, some work on poetry, either writing yourself or uh, translating. And I've read that you co-translated uh, uh, poem, poems of the South Korean poet uh, Ko Un. Uh, do you have any spe specific interest on uh, Korean language or poetry? Yes, I have a specific interest in Korean language and poetry. But it was prompted by an invitation to collaborate with Suni Jung on one of the most difficult books of poetry that the most famous male Korean poet has ever written. Gohan comes out of several different traditions himself, which interests me, a Buddhist, Korean Buddhist tradition, a classical Chinese education imposed by the Japanese, as well as from a very activist pro-democracy position uh, that he took in the 1970s, as well as a very intimate relationship to the landscape and the soundscape of Korea as a peninsula, not as one peninsula split by two nations. So, if someone has said, why don't you collaborate with me on any Korean book of poetry, I might not have been tempted. I was tempted by the challenge of a book of poetry whose origins, whose substance, whose style, and whose use of language were all going to be something that I would have admired even in a poet writing in English. The book of poetry we began with, and I've since translated or collaborated on the translation of five other books of Korean poetry. The book we began with resulted from the first and only visit by a Korean, South Korean poet to North Korea at the invitation of the North Koreans a thaw in relationships around 1998. He was given the run of North Korea. He could go anywhere he wanted in North Korea, extremely unusual. And after he was there for something like three weeks, he came back to South Korea and he spoke about his experience.
But only a year later did he sit down and write poems about his experience. And he wrote 137 poems in one month. Not all of the poems were great, but I would expect that I could defend the statement that 50 of the 137 poems were absolutely fine, and another 40 poems were superb. <laughs> a very good record for one month's work as a poet. And what he did in those poems was write about, in almost each case, a place in North Korea and a place in South Korea. So in each poem you're moving back and forth through the peninsula across time, across generations, across eras, across maybe even 1,500 years, because he understands Korean history, he understands the place of Buddhism in the religion and philosophy of Korea, as well as understanding the very different experiences of people in very many different classes and levels of society. So I thought, for a poem, for a book of poems like this, the challenge is to make sense for a, an American and English-speaking audience of an experience that is so rich and yet so different from ours. What could I do with this? And let me give you an example of the problem. I went to hear Go and Read because I wanted to understand how to translate poetry from a language which in verse has no clear tenses. They all come from context. No clear definition of male or female. They're all defined by context. No clear definition of person, singular or plural. It's all defined by context. No meter. No specific rhythm. And often, no clear definition of singular and plural in the verbs. How does one translate into English poetry like this? So I went to hear go and read his poems. And the poems he read, he sang. I could hear him singing his poetry. He also said in an introduction to his reading that he was a great admirer of English and American poetry, in particular the work of Longfellow and 20th century poets as well. So I knew that he understood what rhythm was, what meter was, and he appreciated it in English. And so I realized that even though there wasn't going to be a formal metric in the translation, I still had to make each of these poems sing. But once I knew that he wanted the poems to sing, I had a key to understanding how to translate. And so, in short, and bringing these answers of mine back to the question at hand, it was the sound of his poetry that was going to be the key for me making the poetry work in English. There's many similarities between uh, you both. You are also, you, you also, uh, when working on a subject, uh, following a macroscopic view, a wide time span, a wide um, <laughs> cross-temporal, cross-cultural, cross-historical, uh, cross-everything <laughs> point of view, you know, a wide span of wide uh, Western society. Yes, uh, well, Gowen is actually more prolific than I am. I'm working now on a series of translations, collaborating with others, including his wife. Because one of the works he has written is called Maninbo, which is a Korean word meaning 10,000. His ambition was to write a poem about every person he had met in his life. <laughs> And he reached about 6,000 of these poems in a 
20 volumes. And uh, we are engaged in a selection of translations from those. The remarkable thing about the poems is that he became famous for breaking with the classical tradition of only writing about noble things in noble language. So he uses the diction of the people that he works on. So for each person he met, the diction is appropriate to that person. And that takes a particular skill as a writer and a particular bravery in Korean culture, which had always admired this elite notion of what the arts and classical refinement should be. <laughs> so, let's move to the subject of sound. Um, to begin with, what's your experience from the uh, Borderland Festival? Um, Of the performances, the one that I will remember the most is the one by the Feral Choir. It's a choir that was just assembled five, six days ago of children from the ages of six or seven to 15. About 20 children. And the director taught them how to, or encouraged them to make different sounds. Sounds, not words. Yeah. And not sounds on key, not sounds on tune, just different kinds of sounds. But then he gave them little hand signals to have them make these different sounds at different times. And he allowed them to make their own personal variations. He wasn't trying to have them all make the same kind of sound. So that when he started directing and asked for a certain kind of sound, you still got this wonderful variety of sounds, both in terms of frequency and tone and in terms of constancy. Some were breathing differently than others. However, he was able to make this into a piece of music, a 30-minute piece of music with the children making sounds of different kinds. Uh, it was a three-day invention, as it were, a composition that worked very well, and was also a teaching instrument for the children as well as for the audience. So it worked pedagogically, it worked musically, and I think it also worked experientially in terms of how we could watch the conductor make a piece of music happen. Um, I think it was a festival with a strong presence of noise music. Yes, it was, yeah. and I think that's why I was invited to speak. Did you listen to, to noise music? I did. I did. I usually walk out in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> One of the sad characteristics of noise music is that although the individual parts may be highly inventive, there is no larger movement that gets me engaged. I don't become more moved after 10 minutes than after 20 minutes or after 30 minutes. <coughs> and uh, So, uh, <coughs> I've, I've gone to, <coughs> I've gone, <coughs> is this chocolate? Ah, let's try it again. <coughs> so I've gone to many festivals now where I'm invited to speak about noise, in which the preponderance of the performances have to do with experimental assemblages of sounds. And I find more or less predictable what's going to happen in terms of the general momentum of the performance. And only rarely do I find that the interaction between the performers and their instruments, however invented or inventive, is something that engages me. And the noise music at the Borderline performance was similar to that. There were 
sounds of all frequencies and vibrations, and I don't appreciate myself constant low throbbing vibration, and I don't appreciate myself constant shrill, uh, but I can understand why they're used. However, if they go on for too long, I will abandon my attempt to pay attention. But I will tell you about the very best. The very best was at Sonic Acts in Amsterdam two years ago. And there was a performance which was an improvisation between a pianist and an electronic music composer and computer whiz named Joel Ryan. And he had tampered with the piano. He had set the piano up so practically each string was connected to his electronic keyboard. So the pianist sat down and began playing at the piano a wonderful jazz improvisation. And gradually, Joel Ryan would change the sound of the individual keys. So the pianist would not any longer know what sound he would play when he hit the note that he had been used to playing for years. And then the pianist had to listen for that new sound and figure out how to continue the improvisation on the piano as Joel Ryan on the other side listened to the new sounds the pianist was making and figure out how to vary the piano again. And because they were both sensitive as musicians and because they could both listen very carefully, it did not matter if the individual strings were sharp or flat or off or on or tuned to a whole new frequency. What mattered was that you could see and participate in this fully engaged improvisatory duet. That was wonderful. Uh, so, when does sound become noise? When does, um, and vice versa? When does a new sound or a noise sound become noise? And what is considered to be noise stops uh, being noise? Um, is it a matter of uh, familiarity, unfamiliarity, uh, nostalgia, aesthetics, cultural meanings, political stances? Um, maybe is it like new technologies? Do we need a subjective period of adaption? in order to, to reach uh, this kind of uh, domestication of uh, noise, in order to, for noise to stop being noise and something else to take its place. <laughs> I'm not being clear enough. No, you are, you are <laughs> completely clear. Unfortunately, my answer is going to be completely ambiguous. <laughs> uh, the argument I make from the very beginning is that noise is relational. There aren't any absolutes about sound that define one sound as forever being noise or not. Never. Uh, and it will never be the case. Moreover, it doesn't happen the other way around. There are no things which will be forever noise. Uh, with two exceptions I will mention tonight. <laughs> and even those there may be exceptions to those exceptions. However, the point of studying the history of noise is to look exactly at the changing cultural relations between people and the sounds they make and the sounds in their environment. And these do change. And they don't change just because of technology. They change because of generational change. They change because there are changes in the environment not induced by human beings at all. If suddenly you live in a world that has a volcano erupting, it's a whole new sound that you must deal with. If you live in an earthquake territory, then you deal with certain sounds and vibrations that you would not otherwise have to deal with. So it's a relational definition of noise, and it's a relation not simply between human beings, or classes of human beings, or genders, but it's also their relationship with the larger environment, which we hesitate to call natural anymore because human beings have so upset things <laughs> or disturbed them. Yet it is relational also through time, so that uh, the same sound may change its meaning many times in your own lifetime. For example, uh,
radio. The first people listening on their crystal sets to radio love the static. They love the static because it was a sign that there was some power that they were in contact with. And they would like to be able to hear something behind the static, but if it was only static, it was still a sign that they had achieved something because no one was listening to static before 1870, 1865. Then, uh, as tuning, just the act of tuning improved in the 1920s, static became something which was funny uh, as cartoonists showed people some believing that they had heard something in the static that others hadn't. Others just fuming because they had been hearing this wonderful music on the radio and suddenly it turned to static. And then by the 1930s when you have frequency modulation, FM, and a better way of then of receiving some signals, uh, static became the enemy. However, in the 1940s, through military research and scientific research, static then was understood as part of a larger notion of information and the fact that noise was an elementary part of our universe represented by static. <laughs> so now static has changed its significance again. It, has had, it now has a philosophical basis for it. <laughs> you know it has to be there. You would like to reduce it, but now you are shown by Claude Shannon that you can't eliminate it entirely. And it's part of thermodynamics already. And then in the 1950s, early 60s, some dancers and some avant-garde theater people begin to think, ah, oh, the static itself is interesting to listen to. Let's do something with the static <laughs> and we'll ignore the rest of the signal. And then you get, after all of these analog variations on static, you get a digital world in which the first proud claim is no static. <laughs> and people say, oh wow, now we have pure music, now we have pure sound, now we have pure tones. And then 10, 15 years later, people say, this is dull. We don't want the purity. Let's get back to the, we can hear some glitch in the background of the CD. We can hear something going on there. Why don't we play with the glitch in the background of the CD, the supposedly suppressed static? Let's, so now static becomes something you seek. It's a kind of the golden unicorn you seek. And eventually then people say, well, if we're just going to be seeking the static in the CD, why don't we go back to vinyl? <laughs> and let's start playing with the scratches in the vinyl. <laughs> so you see how many changes this one basically white noise <laughs> has had within, what, a uh, hundred and five years. So yes, that's the relational aspect of history of noise that I like exploring. <laughs> So, uh, can a silence be considered as noise? Maybe. Uh, noise, uh, different kinds of noise for different people uh, have become something familiar. I think something common in contemporary societies, at least. Uh, they are linked with uh, movement, uh, vitality, compression, technological project, uh, progress, at least in the industrial age and uh, it has become a part of our societies. Uh, although contemporary tendencies um, uh, revolve uh, around the reduction of noise, I think today, uh, making quieter uh, cars, mm -hmm. quieter PCs, quieter mm -hmm. espresso machines. Mm -hmm. So taking all this noise away from us, uh, a noise that we are used to, uh, and uh, promoting silence, kind of this become a new kind of noise? It can certainly become a new kind of disturbing environment. Have you ever been in an anechoic chamber? A dead chamber? No. <laughs> Some people become very disturbed because it is so dead that the quality of their voice changes when they speak. And they seem different to themselves. Some people love it because it, there's no... In, interference. And some people use it just to test 
equipment that is meant for sound deadening, right? I don't know anybody uh, who is as terrified as silence as someone who comes from an urban environment and goes out into the woods. <laughs> But it turns out they're not really terrified by silence, by total silence. That's not what terrifies them. I actually have another talk I give, which is not the one I will give tonight, on the noise of almost nothing. <laughs> that is what's scariest. Gothic novelists used it, children's books use it, haunted houses use it. The scariest thing is hearing a sound that you cannot identify usually because it's just out of range or just below your ability to hear clearly. So you hear it around the bend, as it were. These sounds are the scariest because they open up your imagination to the worst possibilities of what the sound could be, especially if you are alone at night in an unfamiliar world that appears otherwise quiet. So, total silence is pretty much impossible even in space stations. <laughs> you have to basically be floating untethered away from your space station about to die before you will get total silence and even then inside of your space suit, you're going to hear your own breathing. Mm -hmm. so I'm not so worried about total silence. However, the anxiety produced by the noise of almost nothing is very great. And even in 1860, Florence Nightingale noticed this in her notes on nursing. She argued that her nurses should not wear crinoline skirts and make a lot of crinkling noises when they bustle around. Not because she hated the sound, per se, of crinoline. She hated little sounds. She said, if you're going to do something, make it completely obvious. If you're going to close the window, close it with definite action and sound. Why? Not because she was a tyrant, about tiny peccadillos, little mistakes, no. It's because patients in bed who are unable to help themselves are the most persecuted by sounds that are small or just out of range, like people whispering just out of hearing in their room. Is it, are they whispering about them? Are they whispering about the recent soccer match? doesn't really matter what they're whispering about, it's the fact that you can't tell what they're saying. Those sounds, she said, are the most deleterious to the health of a patient in the bed because they are given the sense of their powerlessness by that sound. But if you bang a window, they know what's going on. They can be upset about it. They have power about it. They can be outraged about you're making a big noise. But the quiet little noises that they can't control, those are the noises of almost nothing, which are the worst. I kind of related with that, and I'm not a patient, so <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> so, what is noise for you? Uh, your most bothering noise? Do you have something that... Uh... Oh, what bothers me the most? What sounds bother me the most? Again, it's contextual. Yeah. I'm a historian. Things are contextual. They have oh, to be contextual. <laughs> Uh, but it is also changing for me as I grow older because as I grow older I do not hear the highest sounds anymore. Men lose their higher frequency sounds faster than women do. Uh, even if they haven't been in industrial worlds they still tend to lose it in urban environments. So it, the most egregious sounds for me have also changed over the years, I'm sure. And uh, if I'm trying to think about the most 
upsetting sounds for me right now. It would be from another concert I went to, which started off brilliantly, wonderfully, visually and acoustically intriguing. And, but in the middle, they, the two people decided that they were going to it, simply experiment with uh, long metal rods scraped along an extended metal string. And that scraping high, uneven, powerfully amplified sound was probably the worst sound. I could experience. I walked up. <laughs> so, I think that healer needs to rest. And, uh, I'll, I'll answer uh, one more question. How about uh, that? Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, maybe either uh, something about your latest work or. Uh, something about tonight's um, presentation, how do we connect grime with time and the idea of media? Okay, I won't tell you that. You've got to come to the talk for that. <laughs> uh, my most recent work, my, I have several new projects. One of them is on the history of the changing nature and experience of emergency since the 1760s. I'm looking at it now. from the perspective of noise per se, but I was inspired originally because I had done work on sirens and alarms. And I began looking at other aspects of warning systems. And as I began looking at those, I began realizing that our entire world in 2014, 2015 has a wholly different experience of an emergency than people did in 1765. We have whole new infrastructures to deal with emergencies. We plan for many more emergencies than people did in 1765. We have a number you can call for an emergency. No one could call, period. <laughs> but even so, the single number didn't even appear until the 1930s in England and until the 1960s and 70s of the rest of the world. So the, even the notion of what an emergency is has changed because of that. If you think about it, we have diffused the notion of emergency in so many parts of our lives that wouldn't even be recognized as an emergency through 200, 100 years ago. How would you sell a product called the Hair Emergency Restoration Kit for people having hair emergencies because they had a bad hair day? <laughs> oh, this is new. Uh, it's also new to have an emergency room to go to. There were no such things called emergency rooms, emergency clinics 200 years ago. Having uh, the notion that you would have tr people trained daily in first aid. That's new. Uh, so not only am I going to look at changes in technology or changes in the way in which we have increased our medical ability to handle diseases that were used to be fatal, I'm also going to look at children's book. How do parents teach children when it's necessary to hurry? Children do not know about hurry at the beginning. <laughs> they know about feed me or not feed me, but hurry is not an issue. And you have to teach children what hurry is and when to hurry and why it's important to hurry. You also have to teach children what an emergency is and what it's not. Because initially, any time they get hurt, it's an emergency. And then you say, oh no, go back and play. It's not an emergency. Or you say, I'm taking you to the doctor right now, <laughs> even though you want to go out and play. Uh, so I'm going to look at children's books and see how parents teach children what an emergency is. And I believe it's changed over the last 250 years. So this interests me because it takes in again, as in all of my other books, 
the wide range of human experiences, and it affects so many different parts of our lives now that it, defining how the changes have occurred will help us understand how we've come to be where we are now. Overwhelming. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. It was very rich.